think Mark Holmes, the son of John Holmes, has ever had Stephen Jones on four times on his show? Who in the world is Mark Holmes? Will somebody please tell me? Right the way, back here. And so before we start this video, I gotta get this mother humping thing out of the way. Well, good morning, good people. Happy hump day. I hope you're getting over the hump. Hope you're humping, hoping whatever you do on hump day, you are doing it. People, do you realize that in one week from today, the players will be on the field? One week. We can finally get past the mindless minutia, all of the stupid ass list, all of the takes and everything. And we can start getting into real conversation of things like, I don't know, how many interceptions has Dak Prescott thrown in practice? Because we sitting here, I supposed to be the franchise player and we're in here talking about practice. I mean, it, listen, uh, see, we're, talking listen about practice. we're talking about practice. Not a game. Not, not, a, not game. the game. Not a game. Not the game. We're talking about practice. practice. That's right. We'll be happy to be talking about practice. I'll be honest with you. This offseason has been rough for me. It honestly and truly has been because there's been nothing but seemingly negativity everywhere you go. You know, I don't know how it is as... In, in, depending on your ratings and stuff, and you, you got Dak Prescott anywhere as the number one quarterback in the NFC to the tenth best quarterback in the NFL. The fact that the Dallas Cowboys were able to get him with a fourth round draft pick, as opposed to what some teams have done to try and get themselves quarterbacks, is unbelievable. Is unbelievable. The fact that you got a guy, CeeDee Lamb, I see the latest uh, coaches and executives out there that are rating CeeDee Lamb as the fourth best wide receiver. The fact that you got him with your draft pick, he fell your way, you were smart enough to draft him and be able to utilize him to be the fourth best wide receiver in football. It's a great thing. The fact that you traded back in the draft, picked up another defensive lineman and got arguably one of the best defensive interrupters in the NFL in the draft that you got three guys that are in the top five. I don't care. I mean, the average of, of rankings has all three of them in the top five in their positions. The fact that you got Tyler Smith, a guy who you drafted to replace Tyron Smith, but you found out he is an all pro that we have those four guys on our roster and somehow, and I can even throw in there digs, hopefully, and we're hearing good things about digs, but I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the fact that you were able to pick up these guys and have them on your roster that people literally say, these guys suck and get rid of them, blow it up and start all over is beyond me. It's beyond me. But somehow, that has been the narrative and everything that's gone on. We're seeing all the rankings and stuff that the Cowboys have had the worst offseason. But I'll remind you, we've had bad offseasons before, people. We've had what people deem as the worst offseason. Um, and yet, somehow... The Dallas Cowboys um, find a way to be relevant throughout the seasons. And I don't know if that says more about the players or um, the front office getting, um, getting the players. Because there's no way, there's no way in the world, because we have such a short... Um, we have such a short memory that we don't remember that this offseason is no different than any other offseason for the Dallas Cowboys. That we literally don't 
sign anybody. We don't. But yet somehow we play good enough to get us hope, good enough to challenge for winning the division, good enough to compete, but not quite good enough to win it. But here's the thing. Unless you're Kansas City, Tampa Bay, or the Rams, all the other work the other teams are doing hasn't led them to a Super Bowl yet. Miami has done major moves. Major moves in free agency over the last few years. Getting one of the highest uh, you know, rated young coaches. They ain't any better than the Cowboys. They're not. You can look at the Jets that every single year they have. So, interesting clip from my homeboy, Charles Haley. Talking about Dak Prescott and the contracts and the mess that they've gotten themselves into. Let's listen to this. Because this is very, very deep and spot on. He kept... He kept backloading everything. So now he's screwed. So now he, you know, hey, it's, you, know, it's check, you know, his bill came due. And he doesn't have the money to be able to do that. And so what he's going to have to do is he's going to have to find another way around um, the salary cap or push a lot of the older guys' salary cap way back mm-hmm. and then... You don't know whether these guys going to play one year or two years and then all of it come due again. So, hey, he play, he gambled a long time, and now um, time is up. So if I can tell you this. Trade that. Just put him up for the trade. Trade Guess that. What? Every team in the league be after him. Yeah. Every team in the league. Dak is a winner. Dak is a great person, a great leader. I know him. I go up there all the time. Um, C.D. Lamb. Quiet guy, leader. Hey, he wants the ball. He's a Jerry Rice. Hey, just give it to me. I want. Yeah. And um, so, how do you how do you not keep those guys together? Well, here's the reality of it. How did we get here? How did we finally get here where we are sitting here without signing any free agents? That we're 21st in salary cap, and we haven't signed any of our own players. The thing is with the Cowboys is. You know, they are great at finding talent. But the thing is, this problem with Dak Prescott's contract and paying CD and everybody else, this all goes back to like 15 years before, even longer, because it's been constant mismanagement of the cap and doing salaries. The thing that's so crazy about the Cowboys is they always seem to Reward guys after one good season. Miles Austin. Miles Austin, if you go back and watch, you know, the uh, hard knocks, you always saw Miles Austin's hamstrings were like uh, rubber bands. He was always pulling them. He had one great season. They paid him. Marion Barber, whom had, you know, Marion the Barbarian, rest his soul, incredible beast but he wasn't a full-time starter they broke the bank for him seven years 54 million dollars something like that the jay ratcliffe the terrence newmans the demarcus wares the des bryants and what constantly happened to the dallas cowboys was they would end up being behind in cash and restructuring contracts Tyron Smith's contract was restructured so many times, it literally became an off-season, you know, rite of passage. It wasn't an off-season if you didn't restructure Tyron Smith. Tony Romo, they kept restructuring. And so, Charles is right. They backloaded Dak Prescott's contract. And the reason being is, because they needed to make up for the monies that the, that was already dead money from bad contracts. And 
the craziest thing about this is, I don't know if it's arrogance or what with Stephen Jones. Stephen Jones wants you to think that he is the smartest man in the world and he knows everything. And that, you know, trust the process. But the reality is, is they have been terrible with doing their contracts forever. They just have. They go through D-Law. They screw the pooch. One, they denigrate the guy. They don't pay him. They stretch out the negotiations. And then the end, they give the guy exactly what they want. Sometimes it seems like even more in the case of Zeke Elliott. And the other part of the equation is they end up holding on to guys, I hate to say this, too long. What some teams recognize is I'm better off trading a guy while there's still value with them and getting something back and not paying a boatload of money. Stephen Jones is right. He's like, you overpay when you get free agents. You're right. So the thing is, is you have to figure out how to replace those players without. If your thing is we like the draft, well, that's where you have to become better at actually trading. Because the thing with the Cowboys is they don't seem to get good value when they do trade somebody like Amari Cooper. Because if you look at Amari Cooper going for a fifth round pick, I don't know that he was a number one first, uh, first round pick, but you gave him up for a fifth and then you turn around and you get Trey Lance who right now looks like a linebacker for a fourth so this is where you look at it and say these are the things that hamstring you as an organization you overpay you pay after one good year and contract years and those players are never the same and you bite the bullet Michael Gallup, sorry, Michael Gallup, loved Michael Gallup, which Michael Gallup was a great player like he was his second year. But they decided we're going to lock him down at a contract that will be less because we believe he's going to get back to where he was in the second year. The thing was is after that second year, you had two years of decline and then an injury, and you decided – Let's lock him in to a $13 million a year contract because we can get value because he is injured. And unfortunately, for the money that you spent, and basically you spent about $30 million for about 900 yards of production for two seasons. You decided to reset the market on a running back who had been a bellwether back who had literally been run into the ground. You reset the market with another big contract. When all the statistics say after year four, 90% of the running backs, that's the peak and they go downhill. These are the mistakes that are costing you at the point now where you have one of the better players that you're looking and saying, he's too expensive. Well, maybe if you hadn't wasted money on Jalen Smith, where you had dead money for two years. Maybe if you hadn't wasted money on Michael Gallup. Maybe if you hadn't done a Zeke Elliott contract so big, we wouldn't be where we are here. And the problem here is, too often with us as Cowboy fans is, we'll look at the problem here is we don't have money to pay Dak and we look and we say Dak you're the problem because you want to get paid here's the thing that's kind of funny is we're talking about paying CD you know CD's too expensive right well CD Lamb CD Lamb ranked as the fourth best wide receiver when you think about AJ Brown is getting 32 million dollars a year when you think about um, Devontae Smith getting $25 million a year, these guys are on the same team. When you think about the Dolphins with Tariq Hill with $30 million, 
and Jalen Waddle with twenty eight million. When you think about San Francisco, who's going to have to pay Brandon Ayuk, you know, you look at this and say, you got massive numbers for two guys that are wide receivers. We're only looking at doing one, and we can't do that. And oh, by by, by the way, they've also got the quarterback at $51 million. So this isn't Dak Prescott's fault. Dak has only been $40 million a year. How is it the Eagles can have a $51 million quarterback, a $32 million a year wide receiver, and a $25 million a year wide receiver, and a $13 million a year running back? And still have more money, twice the amount of money than we do. It's because of mismanaging the money. They had to backload Dak Prescott because they immediately signed him to a contract and they restructured it the very first year. And even though his cap hit was only $17 million, they still didn't have money. The next year was $19 million. These are... Very doable. Even last year, it was $26 million. And it wasn't that they spent a whole bunch of money on free agents. It's because it has been a cycle of overpaying and then borrowing and kicking the stuff down because of the mistakes they've made over and over and over again. So that's where we are on those things. So we'll see how they get it worked out. And apparently... The same mistakes we've been making looks like we're going to be making them again because we're sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to do deals that would have been prudent to have gotten done last year with Dak and CD. So I don't know what to tell you, but here's what we are going to do. We do want to get to know each of the other teams in our division. People will say, well, you're always focused in on the Eagles. You're damn right I'm focused in on the Eagles. We got to get past those mother humpers. And the best thing to do is know your enemy. And I'll be knowing some more this afternoon when I'm on with Dan Salio at 3.30 live. And uh, I believe it will be three weeks, three weeks from today, three weeks from today. Um, Actually, no, no, no. Three weeks in one day. Cowboys are actually off on Wednesday. Uh, There's no practice on that Wednesday. And then the next day will be practice against the Rams. So three weeks, and well, I'll be on with Stan three weeks from now, but three weeks in a day we'll be at practice watching the Rams and the Cowboys going at it, scrimmage. But let's go around the horn here with um, the Rich Eisen Show where they're kind of talking a little bit about the NFC East. The NFC East, uh, non-negotiables, the biggest Uh-oh. key, the non-negotiables for teams to be part of the playoff picture, part of the division race in 2024. We'll start out with the team that's got the hardest path, I think it's fair to say, the New York Giants. The non-negotiable to me is that Daniel Jones plays like a $40 million quarterback, which, mm-hmm. by the way, doesn't sound like that crazy of a number based on all the contracts. That I still can't believe since. that nobody but said Jack about him, him having a $40 contract, million contract, contract, which obviously there was a lot involved. We saw some of it play out on hard knocks last week. I mean, when he says, hey, we offered Saquon a whole bunch of money last year and he didn't take it. They tried to get that deal done with Saquon. Right. It didn't happen. They pivoted. They had to tag him. They gave Daniel Jones the contract because all of a sudden your quarterback had the leverage. It didn't work out in 2023. He's had too many injuries. That's the bottom line. He's got to stay healthy. He's got to play up to that level. They've given him a lot of tools. The whole excuse is of, well, we haven't had the weapons around to tell what he is. Now you have. You lost Saquon. This is going to be a lot, though, on Daniel Jones' shoulders. Daniel Jones is getting the Dak Prescott treatment. How to move that team forward. For the Philadelphia Eagles, to me, the non-negotiable would be they get back to playing offense the way that they have when they were one of the best teams in the NFL. From the middle of the 2021 season, Nick Sirianni's first year, through like last November, statistically, I believe they had the best record in the NFL. Somebody can cross-check me on that. It was one of the best records. They're one of the best teams. They obviously had the Super Bowl run. But for like two years there, 
They're mm-hmm. one of the best teams in football, and a lot of things got away from them down the stretch last season. You're now changing out both your coordinators again. It has to come back to mm-hmm. how do we put Jalen Hurts in the best position to succeed? How do we play that style of football? Kellen Moore's reputation is I want to chuck the ball all over the place. I think that in this case, they're going to be more balanced. They paid Saquon a lot of money to be a part of that balance. They're going to get him out in that. space. It's got to be play offense the way that you have when you were one of the best teams in the league because down the stretch last year, that did not look like the same Eagles team. For the Commanders, they are, I, I said this yesterday on the Insiders on NFL Network, if you stacked up all the teams that I don't know what they're going to be, the Commanders m- are one of the top teams on the list. I know Dan Quinn is a hell of a culture builder. I know Jaden Daniels was a hell of a college quarterback. Beyond that, you've got this combination of, you know, the Austin Ecklers, the Bobby Wagners, the, the big names that are more toward the back end of their career. You've obviously got some of the holdovers like Terry McLaurin. I just don't know. I, maybe they get that, that first-year boost like we see all the time from head coaches come in and take a team, and they just – it's a different vibe. You're frowning over there, Brockman. It's, it's a lot to ask. <laughs> right? I, I, I yeah. just think they're going to be back in the top five of the draft again. It just seems almost inevitable. To me, to me, the non-negotiable of this entire thing is keep the pressure off this season. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be looking at this, and and it's going to be the instantaneous. We've got to we got to go out and win. We got Jaden Daniels. We can right now. We can be that team. We, that could be this year's C.J. Stroud. We can be the Texans from a year ago. New coach, Ooh, positive I, I, energy, new quarterback. Keep those expectations yeah, off. They're building this thing. Yes, they went mm-hmm. out and signed a bunch of veterans. But part of that is you bring in Austin Eckler and Bobby Wagner to be culture builders. Not because you think you're getting Bobby Wagner from eight years ago. He's still right. a really yeah. good player. Exactly. But, but he's, you know, he's, may not be he's an all pro. slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, their win total is six and a half. I'd be shocked if that went over. But I, well, I'm not going to give over under advice, but I would say I think that the expectations of Commanders fans are much higher than that. I oh, think definitely. that there's a belief. Yeah. They're trash you got to take this into account. And I'm talking to ownership, too. All right, Josh Harris, Bob Myers, to the extent that he's still involved with the organization, we see all the time NBA teams make midseason changes and make postseason changes and coaches come and go. The NFL is different here. Having a level of patience, which I have no reason to believe Josh Harris won't, but not looking at this like an NBA season where you get to the trade deadline and you're going to make some massive trade and get seven first-round picks. It's not even possible in the NFL, but it's also a matter of you got to take this into account that this is a process to get this thing headed in the right direction. So patience with Dan Quinn, patience with Jaden Daniels, patience with the entire operation, I think is going to be critical. And then with the Cowboys, I mean, there's, there's a lot that still has to be sorted out here. Even over the next eight days before they go to training camp, is C.D. Lamb going to be there? Is Dak Prescott going to get a deal? Do they even potentially do a Mike McCarthy extension prior to the start of the season? How does that whole thing play out? There's not a lot of occasions, I can't think of one, where you had the head coach and the quarterback both going into the last year of their deals, much less on a team that's won 12 games each of the last three seasons. This is rare air that TJ, your Cowboys, are in right now. To me, the non-negotiable for Dallas is that Dak has to play his absolute best. Yeah. We can talk there's, about there's like no, I, I, no we can talk about the defense other way changes. To put it. Dan Quinn's not there anymore. Different culture, different energy with Mike Zimmer. Mike Zimmer's a really good coach. They're going to have to have buy-in on that side too. There's no doubt about it. But this TJ, in my opinion, has to be, we see the best of Dak, the best version. And he's played really well the past couple of years. Second in MVP last we year. We see the best Dak Prescott elevating everybody including into January. Super necessary, man. But like I said, how much better can he get regular season? I, I, I know the, the comeback's going to be the playoffs, but regular season-wise, he played almost as well as you can expect. You yeah. can easily argue that last year with Mike McCarthy calling the plays, remember, for the first yeah, time, truly running his office, about that. was the best that we've seen with that. I for agree. whatever reason, everything flopped in the playoffs. The warning signs in that game were when it's the first or second series and CD comes off the field and he's chucking his helmet yeah, and Mike McCarthy's helmet. going over and talking to him and it's like there's just mm-hmm. something that's a little bit off. And the Packers, to their credit, had a fantastic a- approach in terms fantastic of how they were, they were going to attack him. Tom, yep. there were receivers who I'd never heard of wide open down the field catching balls with no dbs you don't have dontavian wicks in fantasy like brockman who's well, decided whether to keep Not him last in the, year, the last didn't. round you know that's great value it is tremendous value but that versus aj brown in the second is your question 
Green Bay's got a lot of receivers. They got a ton of receivers. Dontavia Wicks is a really yeah. fun story, though. I mean, I, I was watching a clip today with, uh, you know, Mina Kimes and Kevin Clark talking about Dontavia Wicks could be the wide receiver one in Green Bay by the end of the season. That's really exciting. Better than Jaden Reed, better than Christian Watson. I mean, you hope Christian Watson could figure out the hamstring yeah. stuff. Yeah. But Jaden Reed's a pretty darn good player, too. I agree. But he, Wicks could have that Reed breakout this year, like right. that he had, Jaden Reed had last year, I think. Which is a funny thing, too. Somebody told me about, mentioned about Keon Coleman, because remember, he was at Michigan State with Jaden Reed. And Keon Coleman was playing basketball there and was still the first option a lot ahead of Jaden Reed. When we talk about, like, why do the Bills like Keon Coleman enough that they made the trade to go back and then took him at the top at two? It's a big reason of it. Another guy who you're figuring, this guy's got All right, so, thoughts. Is it all on Dak Prescott? Can Dak Prescott deliver? Stay tuned, friends. Stay tuned. We'll find out. It's going to be another season of As the Dallas Cowboys Turn. Hope you all have a great day, and we'll see you all at 3.30. Peace out.